Hey everyone, uh, Ishmael Bentley here from M3 Martial Arts. Um, this is going to be a little bit different presentation or a little bit different uh, video than uh, I usually post on uh, Facebook. So um, I actually have several notes, which I usually don't follow notes when I make videos, but I have a lot of information I'd like to share with everyone. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, if you're watching this video, you probably do, but if you don't know who I am, I am uh, the owner of M3 Martial Arts in St. Louis Park. Uh, Minnesota. So I put together a proposal um, to open martial arts facilities. I specifically did this for um, martial arts uh, in general. Um, so although some of this data is going to be reflective of what's going on in Minnesota, this is a document uh, I hope or think maybe can be used uh, across the board. Um, so uh, again, I've got a lot of notes to go through, so I'm going to go through things in detail. I promise you I'll get to the the proposal and the presentation at at some point but before I do that I want to give you a little bit of information and share some things before I get into the into the proposal okay so um, I sent this out May 18th to several people uh, in Minnesota um, uh, so I sent this to several of our representatives governor's office uh, several decision makers people that can influence um, uh, kind of the course we're on right now so uh, so uh, the the presentation is a little bit dated, but the information in it still pretty much so holds true. Um, so keep that in mind as I go through here. The proposal itself will have a fair amount of detail in it, but it won't get down to all of the granular details. So just keep that in mind as I go through it. Um, you know, if we can convince uh, others that this is the proposal we should be following, then we would get down to the the granular level. But this is intended to be a proposal to kind of give an idea of where I personally, uh, and I know a lot of people think we should be going as far as reopening our gyms. Uh, I'd like to give a thanks to um, the people that helped work on this and collaborated and reviewed with it. So, I mean, that includes attorneys, doctors. Uh, I won't share anyone's name. I know this uh, topic has been uh, somewhat divisive to some people. I don't think this document itself will be divisive, but thanks to everyone that contributed to this or reviewed it. Um, and I'd also like to give a thanks to Heather Edelson. She's a, a representative in Minnesota, a state representative. Um, she actually called me. I sent this to her office, and she contacted me right away. And then I think last Tuesday, I worked with her, um, and she did everything she could to ensure that the governor's office actually has this document. So um, that's being confirmed. We know they have it. We actually believe, based upon some of the things we've seen in some of their their slide presentations recently, they've at least glanced at this document. We don't know that to be true, but uh, based on some of the things we've seen, we believe that to be true. So again, thanks thanks to her. Um, she took the time out of her day to uh, reach out to me personally by phone and, and help me kind of get this into the right hands. Uh, moving on, uh, before I get into a lot of the detail, I want to give you a little bit of info about myself. Um, M3 Martial Arts has been open almost seven years. So in 2013, we opened opened our academy. Um, I've spent approximately 20 years myself as a bioengineer. So I've spent 20 years uh, developing and designing uh, medical implants uh, and medical instrumentation. So uh, I, that's my background prior to having the gym. That's what I spent 20 years of my life doing to get to a point where I could open a gym and basically uh, fund it uh, without having to take out loans and those types of things. Um, being a bioengineer, I have many, uh, several patents and patent applications I've been the inventor on. Um, and I approximate literally tens of thousands of people have implants or devices in them that I was a part of the development team. Uh, so for somebody you probably know or somebody in your circle, maybe even somebody really close to you, there's a fair chance that uh, there's some type of device um, that I helped develop that is a uh, now part of their body. So that's my background. So that's why um, I felt that I could put together a document uh, that would not only kind of meet the, the needs of martial arts gym owners, but also kind of meet the needs uh, of the uh, looking at it from a public health perspective. Um, I don't want to get too much into politics of this. I know that's a very divisive thing. I'll just let you know what I am. I am neither a Republican nor a Democrat. Um, I understand why people are one or the other. Uh, personally, for me, I've decided that uh, I don't like to be a part of a group where you are 
uh, basically expected um, to, based upon party divides, to believe in uh, or to think certain things. So, uh, you know, I don't want to offend anyone, but I think when everyone thinks the same, then no one's really thinking. So I don't see it on either side of the political spectrum. Uh, so I choose to get as much information as I can about a, about a subject and make my decision based upon my own individual preferences. Again, I understand why people are part of one party or another, but uh, when I go through the presentation, I think you'll see that I don't really sit on one side or the other. Um, and I also thought that was important for me to be able to put a document together like this that is uh, that's fair to, to both sides because I understand where people are coming uh, from both sides of this. Um, a little bit about some of the initial stay-at-home orders, um, not just issued in Minnesota, but issued you know across our country. Uh, I uh, made the decision to voluntarily close our gym uh, before um, that was mandated. Um, and I agreed uh, with some of those uh, initial orders. Um, you know, I think people have told me that, you know, I seem to have anticipated, you know, what was going to happen. And in good conscience, I made the decision to, to close our facility. Um, you know, obviously hoping it wouldn't be closed as long as it has been. Um, but I like to think we, we tried to get out and ahead of this. And again, I agreed with a lot of those initial orders. Um, the only thing I would probably say I maybe should have been done differently is I think they probably should have been earlier and they sh probably should have been done more definitively. Um, I'm very confident that when history writes this story and history will write, write this story, not politicians, that uh, when the story is written, um, we'll look back on it and say those that took very early and deliberate action are the ones that dealt with this the best. And at this point, we seem to be in a, a very reactionary mode. Uh, I kind of get that at this point, um, based on some of the decisions that have been made. Uh, but just keep in mind, I agreed with a lot of the initial orders. Again, I, I felt that maybe they should have been done a little bit earlier, a little bit, with a little bit more uh, definitiveness. Um, but that is kind of my position on that. At the same time, I also think as soon as we made the decision to close, you know, people should have been working on developing a plan to reopen and I know that may be difficult to do because you know we learn more about this every day but at the same time you know there should be contingency plans you know if this doesn't happen and this does happen and this is this is the plan so I think you when as you see as I talk about this I'm trying to look at this from a very uh, balanced perspective I'm also not someone that sits up uh, late at night watching hoax videos from a discredited research scientist um, you know I understand you know, given my background, that those are people just trying to manipulate people, trying to become famous. Um, so again, like when I look at this, I look at this from a very scientific approach and I, I do my own research. Um, so, uh, so enough of that. Um, so when uh, I go through this, I think you'll see, I don't look at this as this is an A or C decision. A is, you know, martial arts gyms uh, stay closed for you know, uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. From a business standpoint, that's that's just not sustainable for us. Uh, C is just to reopen and go back to normal. Um, that's also, I don't think, I think that would be foolish. Um, and I think as you go through and I see and see that in this presentation and proposal, there's, there's five phases. Everything here is kind of like, a, almost like a, a slow release medicine. It's, it's a little bit, you know, at a time. Um, so to me, it's not A or C, it's B. It needs to be in the middle and it needs to be balanced and we need to take into account, you know, not only our GMs, but also the public health. And I think, you know, this document, as I go through it, I think you'll see it strikes a, it strikes a very solid balance between the two, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go through the slides now. Um, there are a number of slides, so, you know, please be patient. I'll try to go through them as quickly as possible. Uh, this is the first time I've actually shared this document publicly. Um, if this is a, you know, again, if you're, if you're in Minnesota and own a gym and you'd like to see this presentation or have it, I'll definitely share it. Um, uh, if you think it can help you in any way, if you are not in Minnesota and would like to have this presentation and share it or use it, uh, and you think it can help you, I will gladly share it. Um, so I'm making this public basically to, to let people see it, um, 
hopefully, you know, everybody that looks at this, if you're in agreement with what I'm proposing or it resonates with you, uh, it would be great with people share this video with as many people as possible. You know, for us at this point, I think what we'd really like as gym owners is we just want to be, as martial arts gyms owners, we at this point, we just want to be heard. Um, you know, we, we would like to have a seat at the table discussing, you know, how this is affecting our business and the best way to reopen our businesses. Um, and there obviously may be agreement and disagreement over that, and that's fine. But we would like to have a seat at the table, per se. Um and help people understand, hey, we're not, you know, lifetime fitness. We're not uh, another type of fitness facility, and we should not be viewed as the same. Okay, so going into the slides again, this was put together May 18th, uh, so the slides are about a little bit more than a week old now, but as we go through the slides, uh, you know, I'll start with basically kind of an agenda, what's on the slides, and then we'll get into the detail. Okay, so discussion topics. And again, keep in, keep in mind, this was put together uh, to basically be delivered, um, uh, you know, for example, this is this was sent to the, the governor's office, hoping his advisory council that is making decisions on this would look at this. So keep that in mind as I go through this uh, presentation. Um, discussion topics, one, staff members and their responsibilities, two, the facility, three, members and their responsibilities, four, uh, I'll talk a little bit about high risk members. I won't get into too much detail there, but I'll give you kind of our definition of high risk. Uh, next would be martial arts facilities in comparison to regular fitness facilities. You know, what makes us different? How are we the same? Uh, next would be training in the phase reopening plan, how, how we kind of get back to slowly getting back to normal. Then plan phases in comparison to current modeling. So uh, when I get to this slide, just keep in mind, uh, this is in comparison to the modeling in Minnesota, the date of this presentation, maybe that data has changed, but um, you know, I have a couple, I have an overlaid uh, chart where I'll put our plan in comparison to what is being modeled in the state of Minnesota. But again, if you want to use this slide and you're in Wyoming, um, you know, just go get your data from there and then, you know, balance your phases accordingly. Uh, the last two things are instructor role and responsibilities, and then the last thing is additional measures we're taking to, uh, we would take if, if we could follow this plan. So staff members and their responsibilities. Uh, each staff member would be thoroughly trained on COVID based on MDH, CDC guidelines, things like that. Uh, prior to the start of each business day, uh, each staff member would do a self-evaluation if they're exhibiting any symptoms. Uh, if no, um, staff members could proceed their normal day um, uh, as expected. And again, I know, you know, people can be asymptomatic, but, you know, we're looking at, you know, the most that we can do in a reasonable manner um, to get things uh, back to normal. Uh, if yes, uh, if they do exhibit symptoms, they would contact their supervise and they would not come to the facility until further medical evaluation. Um, and then there would be, I know this has come up in, in other industries, but, you know, somebody cannot come to work because they have, you know, or they potentially have symptoms of COVID-19 and there wouldn't be any repercussions to those persons. So we, we want to take care of the, you know, the people that are in our gym, <clears throat> uh, before class, the facility will undergo a thorough cleaning with the appropriate materials. Uh, this is mats, door handles, uh, any at risk surfaces. Uh, we actually already have bought uh, an electric disinfectant fogger to get to other surfaces. Uh, I don't know that that's necess necessary, but we wanted to take as much measure as we could um, when we do get back to back to opening the gym uh, to make the place as sanitary as possible. Uh, staff members will ensure the facility is always stocked with appropriate cleaning materials. So we don't want to be running out to Target to try to, to look for stuff you know, the, the, when class is starting. So uh, there would be uh, a surplus of inventory so we don't end up in that situation. Um, and then we have bought one of the no contact thermometers so everybody would be expected to uh, uh, to take their temperature um, before they come to class or as the class is starting. Uh, the facility itself, the training area will be sectioned into 10 foot 10 spaces. I know six foot is what we what we often hear but we would want to give ourselves a little bit more space considering what we're doing. Uh, there'd be a six foot buffer area between each space, uh, air conditioner, hand, heaters, fans, etc. Uh, we turn those off to decrease circulation. 
Uh, there'd be no renting of uniforms or any kind of uh, gear, um, you know, at least for the near term. Um, we would put up signs uh, in the gym, um, you know, communicating to members how we're cleaning, you know, to make them feel comfortable. Uh, and we'd also put up signage in the gym to ensure, hey, if you have symptoms, you know, you're not expected to, to train uh, until further notice. The locker rooms would be closed initially. Eventually, we would hope to open those up, but just to keep people from congregating, uh, we would expect people to be dressed uh, entering and leaving the facility. Uh, all the seating would be removed. Um, so initially, we wouldn't have any spectators. Eventually, we would hope to, to get back, but for example, some uh, we would expect parents to basically you know, drop their kids off at the front for the kids' class. Kid would do the class, and they would pick them up at the front, and we would, we would help orchestrate that. Uh, but initially, we would we would remove all the seating just so there's not uh, people kind of congregating in the lobby area. Uh, prior to entering and leaving the mat area, each member would dis disinfect their feet and their hands. Uh, members would be staged to enter and leave the mat in an appropriate manner. Uh, members must exit the facility immediately after class. No congregation uh, in the in the facility. We would close the facility Saturday and Sunday initially, so we could go undergo a thorough cleaning each day. So what we would like to do is, at least initially during the early phases of this, is get to a point where we establish the habit of redundancy cleaning, and that would include uh, Saturday and Sunday, really to come in and give the gym a thorough cleaning and make sure that, you know, coming around Monday, uh, everything is good to go. Um, so I don't know that closing on Saturday is necessary. I do think initially it's, it's good advice. It just shows that, hey, we're taking the appropriate measures uh, to do the right things here. Uh, members and their responsibility. Uh, members are generally classified as non-high risk or high risk. Uh, for non-high risk members, um, you know, each member should check themselves prior to coming to class uh, to ensure they're not demonstrating symptoms. Um, we would actually have a form or on the little that little iPad check-in, we would have something that we would sign off and say you're not demonstrating symptoms. Uh, any member demonstrating symptoms would be asked to leave the facility and undergo further medical evaluation. Uh, someone from the gym would then follow up with them and to determine when it's appropriate for them to come back. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a common thing in jujitsu. There's a lot of, you know, uh, fist bumping, which you know, you know, not too long ago was okay, but uh, there's a lot of shaking hands, hugging. Uh, we would, you know, we would refrain from all of that. So, kind of a tough thing to do. I mean, there's a lot of culture in jujitsu, but. You know, just certain things that are going to take a, take some time to get back to normal if they ever get back to normal. So uh, we would refrain from that at least, you know, uh, early on and probably well into the phases, probably all the way through phase five, to be honest. Uh, and then over time, hopefully kind of get back to the way things were. Uh, high risk members, uh, again, this, this is kind of, you know, a very general definition of high risk members. Uh, anyone with pre-existing medical uh, conditions, um, those that may commonly encounter uh, individuals um, that may may have this, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about people that work for in, in healthcare and things like that in a little bit. Um, anyone that's recently traveled outside of our area, uh, although they may may or may not, you know, exhibit symptoms, uh, just to be very conservative, we would classify them as, as high risk and um, potentially ask them when they come back to you know, self-quarantine for two weeks or whatever um, until maybe we're into the later phases. Uh, in circumstances where there may be a high-risk person directly or indirectly involved, um, say, for example, you live with your grandmother, um, we would ask you to contact the facility manager and we would determine the best course of action, right? You know, what's your situation? You know, what do we think's the pro what are the appropriate guidelines at, at that time? And as you guys have seen, the guidelines... You know, as we learn more about this, they they change uh, on a pretty consistent basis. So uh, we would make a decision together on what, what to do if you were living with somebody you thought was high risk and you wanted to come in and train. We would, uh, we would make a decision together what's the most appropriate thing to do. Um, healthcare workers, we would classify them as somebody that maybe, you know, some I know some people right now that the majority of the people they're dealing with uh, um, in a hospital, um, you know, have symptoms or have been diagnosed with this. Um, so we would classify them as, as high risk. And we have a plan for them to come back and train, and you'll you'll see that uh, later on. In addition, at, uh, in the initial phases, no new members would be accepted into the facility 
Uh, and then when we get into phase five, it's kind of getting kind of back to normal for kind of four leads into that. You know, that would probably be the point where we would entertain. Maybe we can let someone outside our facility train. Um, so this is, uh, you know, these couple of slides are very important, you know, and uh, when I put these slides together, uh, you know, I, as a, you know, not enough in my background, but as someone that has been in the martial arts for oh, such a long time. Uh, so I've been doing the martial arts now for closing in on 30 years and I've been doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for approximately 21 years. So, um, so I know our culture um, and I think it's important that, you know, although we're typically kind of lumped in with, you know, fitness facilities, you know, you can go to a lot of fitness facilities and whether that's lifting weights or a treadmill or bike, those, those places can set, you know, their facilities up in a way that maybe you can keep, you know, physical distancing and, you know, and obviously lowers their capacity, but, um, you can do a lot of those things for us, you know. Um, specifically in, you know, things like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, Judo, you know, anything, um, you know, Muay Thai. Uh, a lot of the things that we do involve training partners. Um, and the next bullet point I think is, is realistic and I think fair. If we were to open under the same guidelines as regular fitness facilities where we can not have contact with a training partner, you know, I think those classes are very quickly going to start to deviate from uh, what they're intended and maintaining physical distancing will become challenging. You know, I think every gym owner, you know, and, you know, the people, you know, that are, you know, making guidelines for things like this, you know, may have the best intentions. But um, given what we do, um, I think controlling that long term uh, and saying people are going to have to be separated for maybe weeks, months on end is a very challenging thing to do. Um, so, <clears throat> um, the next thing is eventually, I think there's a possibility that some facilities would just forego the recommendations and they would start to train as normal. And obviously that's where we want to get to eventually, but to, to do that early on, I don't, I don't think would be the most responsible thing to do. So we want to do this in a manner where people can slowly get back to their norm and not as, be asked to deviate so far from their norm that it's going to cause things to tilt completely the other way. Uh, and then I, I, you know, as a gym owner, I know this would, would happen. Uh, facilities would begin to train behind closed doors um, and they would just, this would potentially lead to a lot of people from different facilities congregating uh, at one facility at some point. And at least where we are right now, uh, I think that would be a, be a mistake. So, um, we don't want to be, uh, have a facility or we don't want to have a group of people become a hotspot. We don't want that to reflect on us that we didn't, uh, go out and, uh, obey, you know, guidelines and all of a sudden things kind of spiraled out of control with us. So with regards to opening martial arts facilities and taking all those things to account, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Some of you that are probably watching this video, I've probably talked to you about this just to see how you feel um, about some of the things that are going on. So based on everything I just mentioned, I think the best thing for us to do is to actually allow people to train together in a very limited and controlled fashion uh, initially and to slowly let that become get yeah, a little bit more each time uh, and i think if we do that uh, facility owners and gym owners can control our circumstances in a way um, that you know i can say to a student hey you know we, you can't train with you know everybody in the gym today but you can train with this person maybe in a few weeks you can train with another person right and over time we're going to give a little bit more uh, to each to each individual and that will be manageable and controllable um, but I firmly believe if we're asked to stay you know six feet apart for you know one to two months and facilities open that is going to be a, a, a major major problem for our industry so this is actually the the plan uh, and you'll see a lot of times you see there's three three phases. I've actually broken this down into five phases. So I've got a little bit more 
uh, a little bit more detail than maybe some of the other plans for not just our industry, but other industries have, have put together. Uh, so we would have a weekly schedule initially. Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be, uh, you know, for the for our, our older members. And Tuesday and Thursday would be for uh, children classes. And again, like maybe these recommendations slightly alter. Um, you know, again, if we did have any input on the guidance that we're going to use and, you know, maybe others disagreed maybe about, you know, doing the schedule this way. I mean, those are... Those are things that we can definitely, uh, we have flexibility on. But this is my initial uh, initial thoughts. And again, you'll see Monday through Friday, this allows Saturday, Sunday to be used for, you know, really deep cleaning of the gym. Uh, there's five phases over nine weeks. Phases one through four take up eight weeks. Phase five is actually getting back to pretty much so uh, normal. And so that would be phase nine on, or, or week nine and on. Phase one. So phase one, members are only allowed to train with one person for the first two weeks. So let's say person A partners up with person B for for two weeks. There, uh, let's say it's a, an, an uh, uh, let's say it's an advanced class um, or one of the essential classes. You know, they come in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's their three days. They can train. That those two people have to train together for two weeks. So if A shows up and B doesn't. Then for, for those two weeks, then um, uh, A has to ensure their partner is there. So that everybody has to kind of coordinate this together. Uh, it would be recommended that uh, it would be a member of the same household, if that's possible. Um, you know, for the children classes, we would allow parents to participate with their child in the class. Uh, if that child does not have a, uh, a sibling to kind of accommodate that. If it is not possible to train with a family member, uh, two members that have not demonstrated any symptoms, would we would work with them to assign them to each other. So we would just wouldn't put A with B. We would work, A, are you comfortable with training with this person? That's going to be your, your partner for two weeks. Uh, so whoever you're assigned with at day one would be your partner day 14. And that could not deviate for phase one of this. Uh, the first two weeks would just be technique and drilling. Uh, so there would be no... No live training uh, during the first two weeks. Um, and at least initially, members would only be allowed to come to two classes per week. So we would control, you know, how often people are coming and, you know, how many people are coming into each class, things like that. Phase two is also uh, two weeks, obviously happens after phase one. Phase two would allow members to have multiple training partners, uh, but no more than two. So theoretically, you could have a, a group of three. So as you'll see, we're giving a giving a little bit more over time um, to try and to try to coordinate that with hopefully you know you know Minnesota is, is starting to flatten out and we're you know we're starting to see things hopefully um, situations start to become better uh, during that phase. So phase two, uh, technique drilling. We would also do some limited live rolling, so situational rolling as you guys know it. So. Uh, those types of things, uh, but not quite back to full rolling yet. Okay, that's going to happen in in phase three. Uh, same thing. Members going to attend two classes per week. Phase three is also two weeks. Um, now members could have up to three training partners. So theoretically, you could be in a group of four, right? Or as we do drills, right? You could tra a you could train with B, C, or D, uh, and you would expect it to only train with those people over the course of that phase. Um, now we would do technique drilling and we would actually do a little bit more live rolling beyond just situational rolling. Um, and then now we would allow people to come to three classes per week, right? So we'd open that up, right? So now we're kind of in the middle. We're kind of like balanced between phases one and phases five. Um, at this phase, and you'll see it, I have a chart of this eventually. We would let members that have high contact, so healthcare workers, for example, uh, potential people that are EMTs, uh, this is when we would propose they would come back into training. You know, we, we, we take into consideration that those people may have more interaction with somebody and may be more likely to become symptomatic. But we also take into consideration that, you know, we want to take care of these people because, you know, this is their job. We don't want them to come into a facility and, you know, potentially be exposed and then, you know, they're asymptomatic, they go out and then they start sharing with their people. So, you know, it's not just about, um, you know, um, 
keeping them from training. Um, it's also about, you know, helping them protect us and helping them uh, or helping us protect them. Uh, as everybody knows, I mean, healthcare workers during this time, it's been a tough time for a lot of uh, people in this industry. Um, it's also been, you know, inspirational to see what a lot of people in the healthcare industry uh, uh, have done and continue to do. So, I mean, they're very, um, you know, and as you guys know, they're a very important part part of our fabric of our gym. I mean, we have many doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants that that train with us. Um, so we want to make sure we're we're taking care of them, and we do want them to get back to training eventually because I know that training for them is just as important as it is for the rest of us. Uh, phase four, it's also two weeks. Uh, phase four would allow members to have a normal number of training partners. Uh, so not quite back to normal, but now you can have, you know, you can train with anybody that's in the class. Uh, this would be a normal class format. Um, at this point, we would determine, is it okay to open on Saturday? Uh, honestly, we potentially could make a decision to open on Saturday before then, but this is why I put it in the phase. Um, again, it would, we take a lot of things into consideration when is, when is the time to open the gym up to more classes? And this just doesn't have to do with classes. Like, as right now, we're thinking, you know, initially in phase one, we would have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there'd be one class. Tuesday, Thursday for kids, there would be one class. But as we progress, then we maybe open the schedule up. Um, or based on how the scheduling works and getting a certain number of people into the gym, we would have to, you know, consider maybe having, you know, more than one class uh, in phase one. But we would do it in a manner where there's a, a gap. Um, but right now, we would look at phase four as potentially opening up on, on the weekend again. Uh, we would still maintain the area spacing, the mat area spacing that uh, uh, I talked about earlier, the 10 by 10 space uh, and the six foot buffer. Um, so again, we'd have to control the number of people in the class, but at least now we'd start to have a little bit more of a normal, normal training class. Uh, obviously, we would still use strict cleaning guidelines, you know, our GM, our facility, we, we, we kind of pride ourselves on being a very clean facility initially. Um, you know, and I know a lot of gyms take this very seriously and, um, you know, more strict cleaning guidelines are probably going to play, be in place for a lot of, a lot of, not just gyms, but a lot of facilities going forward here, uh, as we kind of, kind of dig ourselves out of this <clears throat> phase five, um, phase five can only begin after phases one through and four through four are completed. Um, and that's important. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this, I think, in the last couple of slides. But uh, one, two, three, four, five is is the logical sequence. But it could be one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and I'll talk about what I mean a little bit later. Um, this would kind of be our return, return to normalcy. Uh, we would now remove the 10 by 10 training uh, square uh, and just let the gym, the mat be its normal space as it uh, as it was prior to this. Uh, we would go back to our full regular schedule. Uh, we would still obviously, as I discussed, maintain strict uh, cleaning guidelines. So that's phases one through five. So phase five is basically week nine um, as we hope to start to get back to normal and start to get people uh, feeling you know, comfortable in, in the gym again. We wouldn't necessarily, I mean, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people are going to come back to this when they, when they feel the time is right. Um, so obviously we would, you know, eventually like to open our gym and offer these classes. But, you know, our expectation is people come back to when they're comfortable. We're not going to pressure people that, hey, the gym is open. You know, you need to start training again. If there, if, you know, if somebody tells me, Ishmael, like I need, you know, I need another month to kind of, for whatever reason, to, to be ready to do this. I mean, that's perfectly okay. We don't expect everybody to come back at one time. Um, you know, and I think the way we've set this up um, in phases, I think it, it allows someone to come back when they're ready. You know, okay, I'm ready to jump back into this. This is the phase I'm going to be going into. Uh, this is over the course of, you know, a little bit more than two months to get back to kind of normal. Um, you know, and we want people to, to do this at their own speed. So again, this slide is, is again, this was, this is taken, um, uh, this is a model taken from a presentation uh, put together by the University of Minnesota and MDH. Uh, when I put these slides together, I don't know if this is still true. I'm assuming this is still true. I'm assuming if it's not exactly, uh, it's very close. Uh, the peak uh, in Minnesota was expected to be June 29th. So this is our phases over the course of time. Um, and again, at one point we, we were hoping that 
you know, we would open June 1st. Um, that obviously is not the case for us right now. Uh, so take into account that the, the timeline on this was taken into account if we actually did open June 1st. Right now, we don't really have a, a defined date when we would expect to open. I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, they're doing things like this and, and people sharing this and, and contacting, you know, your representative and people that are, you know, influencers in, in, you know, the process of, of reopening businesses and, you know, and uh, everything that's going on right now. I'm hoping we can start to ha be a part of the conversation so we understand when when it may be possible for us to open up. But regardless of that, if you look at this timeline, when I initially put this together, our phase three, okay, which is kind of the middle, and remember that's when we said, you know, healthcare workers could come back. Uh, we start to do a little bit of tra live training. Uh, the June 29th peak actually would happen in that phase. So as we go through phase three, phase four, and you'll see they're color coded, you know, hopefully we're starting to come down the curve. And if we're coming down the curve, we feel that that would allow us to start to open up and do more things. Uh, so phase one would be red, right? This is kind of a critical phase. We're in a, you know, a situation where, um, you know, obviously none of us want to be, but we would, we would take that phase very, very seriously. And then phase two is a little bit. So it kind of goes from red to, uh, to, a, to an orange color. Um, you know, again, that's where, you know, a person can have two training partners, but again, they're, you know, the only situational training, uh, no full live rolling. Then phase three, you know, that's most of, most of that phase, theoretically, when I put together, this would be, you know, we would be coming down the curve. So we would, we would hopefully be able to get back and do a little more activity. And phase four would be, you know, you'd have, you know, you could train with many people. Uh, and then phase five would be going back to uh, normal. So, you know, the people that I collaborated with on this, we, we spent a lot of time, you know, not just talking about what the phases should look like, but the timing of the phases. Um, and when we put together again this, we were thinking maybe June 1st would be a possibility for reopening our facility. Um, and we we, uh, we took very seriously, like, the data that had been presented. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people on the data side, you know, from the scientific community side, uh, you know, the University of Minnesota, MDH, you know, they put a lot of time into modeling and, you know, revamping the modeling based on the current data. So we thought it was important to take their data and, and look at our, from our perspective and see how we could match that most closely and, and most responsibly. Okay. And again, if you um, have any desire to use this presentation and you're not in Minnesota, uh, this, this slide is somewhat changed based upon our situation, but um, if this is something you want to use or this approach you want to use, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can definitely use it. Just keep in mind that, you know, this was uh, a viewpoint from us May 18th around our data. So not everyone would have, you know, June 29th as the peak when within, within their state if they're outside Minnesota. Uh, instructor role and responsibilities. Uh, one, maintain control of the class format and restriction zones. And again, I... You know, I can't, I can't reinforce this enough that if if we can start to let people do the thing that they're so accustomed to doing in some kind of controlled form and manner, um, this is going to be much easier for constructor to control, um, opposed to telling people that are used to having contact with each other that they're not going to be able to do that for for weeks on end. Okay, uh, but this would be you know one of the primary responsibility with the instruct for the instructor during the class and then before and after class making sure the facility is is appropriately clean um that would take into account obviously making sure you know individuals are maintaining the appropriate distance if you're in a group of two that that group of two stays in their their square and doesn't go outside of it uh as i said you know we would the instructor would be responsible making sure the facility is clean before before and after each class um the uh, the next one is um, uh, wearing a mask uh, during phases one or two. I don't know that this is entirely responsible, but or entirely uh, in uh, entirely uh, required. Um, but myself, I think uh, as an instructor, um, phase one, phase two, um, we would make the recommendation that the instructor wears a mask of some sort. Uh, what I've recommended is a, is a mask similar to an N95 without the exhaust valve. 
Um, if that was not possible, if the instructor couldn't get a hold of that, um, then I would suggest, you know, you know, uh, doing the appropriate research, getting the, getting the, the best possible solution you, you could, uh, it may be difficult, uh, to teach a class, um, with a mask, but I think it can be done. Um, you know, I've done some things recently with a mask just from an experimentation standpoint. Uh, so again, I mean, I know some people may not think it's a requirement for an instructor during phase one or phase two. Uh, to wear a mask, but given where we are, I do think it's probably uh, initially the uh, um, the responsible thing to do. So I would suggest suggest that. Um, you know, if a restruct an instructor requires a member of the class to demonstrate moves, that person would be the only person that instructor used during the entire class, and the instructor themselves would have limited contact with members during each class. So they would also remain maintain their physical distancing. Um, you know, I think as we learn more and more about this virus, uh, a viral load is, is an important thing and that can happen in many forms and fashions. But, you know, we, you know, obviously we want the instructor to, you know, protect the students, but we also want the students, you know, the instructor to be protected as well. So, you know, we wouldn't expect instructors to be going around and, you know, uh, making a lot of contact with students as they're, you know, correcting moves or whatever, we would expect that instructor to try to maintain their physical distancing as well, because the instructor would be the person in the class that theoretically could come, come in contact with everyone in the class. Uh, if, you know, in phases one and two, uh, or, or early on in the phase where you only have a limited number of training partners. Uh, so we, we would want to make sure that instructors are, are kind of following their own physical distancing guidelines. Uh, additional measures. Um, you know, if any member becomes symptomatic during, uh, during this time, uh, they would be required to get further medical evaluation, uh, until a further evaluation is completed, uh, they would not be allowed in the facility. Um, we would contact the people, um, uh, in that class and let them know of the situation. Uh, we wouldn't let anyone know the member's name, um, that has exhibited symptoms or being diagnosed with, being diagnosed with this. We would maintain the privacy. <laughs> Um, if someone does test positive for, for COVID during this time that's training, um, before being allowed back into the facility, they must provide documentation that they're, you know, free of the, uh, virus. Uh, and again, someone, um, that was in the same class as that person would be notified. The member's privacy would be maintained. We'd ask those members to, uh, closely, uh, self-monitor during that time. Uh, I believe this is the last slide. Uh, twenty percent is just a number. I put a little bit of thought into it. Um, it's not a hard and fast number. Um, honestly, this is a number that I would I would hope to, you know, if we were to ever be able to have a discussion with you know, uh, the people that are advising you know governors and such for this, from a scientific standpoint, this would be a conversation I would like to have with them. But it's twenty percent is the number number I came up with myself. If 20% of members attending one class became COVID-19 positive, um, MDH, that's the Minnesota Department of Health, if you don't live in Minnesota, uh, we would have a, a, a kind of a liaison, you know, at MDH that we would, uh, would be our contact point that we would contact and say, hey, we, we know that we have this many people that were in this class that were, uh, that have tested positive for this. Um, and after a discussion with them, um, if we deemed it necessary and we, um, you know, and we would take very seriously, you know, their advice and their perspective, we would regress to a previous phase. Uh, for example, you know, if we had a significant number of members test positive during phase four and phase four is where we start to get, you know, somewhat close back to normal training, you know, that would potentially necessitate a return back to phase one, two or three, uh, whatever we determined was the, the most appropriate course to try to get our facility kind of uh, back on track. Um, so that's why I said, you know, we, we, go, we may go phase one, two, three, and then we may have to go back to phase one and then go two, three, four, five. You know, hopefully we would go one, two, three, four, five, but, you know, we would want to do the right thing. Uh, and sometimes you got to go a little bit backwards to, to go forward. You know, if we start to see something ramping up in our facility, we just would not want to you know, uh, irresponsibly keep moving forward uh, when we know we may have a potential issue on our hands. You know, we would want to dial back the th things to, uh, 
to move fo so we can move forward in the appropriate manner. Um, so this is all the slides. Uh, this is, as you can probably tell, this is you know not just, not just for me, but you know a lot of people that you know were involved in this process. This was a lot of work. This wasn't just you know thrown together uh, over a couple of hours. Um, there was a lot of time, effort, um, and and research put into this. Um, I haven't really been, you know, outside of, you know, a couple of updates and, you know, closing our, our facility initially. This is not something on at least social media I've been, um, most of you guys know social media is not really my, not really my thing. Uh, I've not been, someone's been very, uh, vocal about this. Um, but what I have done is, um, I've done my own research. I've kind of sit back and watched as things progress, you know, not just from, you know, what's going on publicly, but, you know, what's going on in gyms and, you know, not just martial arts facilities, but what are other facilities, uh, you know, of any type that are maybe similar to our scenario doing not only across the United States, but uh, across the world. So there were a lot of things taken into account um, putting this together. And again, I think you'll, I hope, I hope you see that, you know, I, again, you know, I don't think it's an A or a B or a C situation. Um, I think finding balance in the middle with B is is the uh, appropriate thing to do. Uh, I honestly think that you know not only this would this help us you know kind of re you know kind of start to slowly reopen our our business. I also think it has taken into very strong consideration uh, public health, and I I personally feel. Uh, that, you know, I can argue not only does this allow my business to open, but this guidance per se uh, is as responsible to the health of the the public as a as a community as um, a guidance that would say, well, we have to stay, you know, this far apart for so long. If I honestly felt that that would work in martial arts, gyms, and facilities, I would totally support that. Uh, but I know the culture of our facilities, that is not something I think is sustainable for very long. And I think this provides a, an, an alternative and quite honestly, a better alternative. You know, this is a, um, you know, obviously a, a stressful situation for a lot of us. The, you know, I, I, I think it's important for me to, to explain this to people. Like when I put this document together, you know, I didn't put this document together being, you know, I have to open my gym um, and I have to do it in any manner as possible. Most of you that actually know me um, know that when I put this document together, I put this document together with literally the, not only the interest of gym owners, but the the health interest of you know everyone involved in the gym and then those in their circle and those that they may come in contact so uh, i took this putting this document together uh you know very seriously from all perspectives and i again tried to to find a balance and i do think it's important to to for people to know that you know we have uh in theory is probably you know one of the most uh, accomplished and successful martial arts, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, specifically is what we do, facilities in the Midwest. And, you know, with that being said, um, I'm not, you know, going anywhere. You know, Ishmael Bentley is not going to disappear off the face of the earth and, and not do Jiu-Jitsu anymore. The threat to my facility, M3 Martial Arts, not being the same as it was before this is very real. Um, the gym as we know it, um, if this goes on for much longer from a from a uh, a business perspective, may not exist as it did uh, before. So, and that's coming from someone that had a very successful business. So um, that has taken a lot of time and effort to build. So I know people that are have you know. GMs are just getting started and 
you know, maybe much earlier in the phase and, you know, they're just trying to figure things out and how to be successful, you know. So imagine if a facility such as ours, you know, um, that has hundreds of members is looking at this and um, is now starting to, you know, have to entertain the thoughts of, you know, what if the gym never reopens as it did before? You know, imagine the gym that's, you know, six months old and has 50 students, you know, the pressure that, that they're under. So when I put this together, I put this together again, specifically, you know, I, I you know, was looking for a, an audience in Minnesota to take, to take a look at this document. But I, I also had in the back of my mind, you know, this document is important for people, you know, not only in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but martial arts in general, um, and not just in Minnesota. Um, and you know it it seems like we're we're in a situation where we're we seem to be the last ones in line that are going to get to open their business in in some form or fashion and that uh uh that's a little bit of a stressful situation um and you know I, a lot of you people know me that you know i haven't literally you know i i i, I did a, a a zoom private one day uh my daughter and i have done some stuff um i've had many people ask me, um, Ishmael, can you, uh, you know, can you come to the gym and do privates? Um, and, you know, up until this point, you know, I have told everyone basically no, um, because I want to start to see some type of, uh, you know, establishment of some kind of normalcy. Um, so if I do a private with one person, then, you know, I have the availability to do a private with someone else that wants to do a private, you know, and I don't have uh, mats in my basement. I can't, I can't do that in my home. Um, so I would have to go to my, my gym. And, uh, at this point, I don't think that that would have been the responsible thing to do, uh, to go in and do a private. And then other people were asking when do I get to come in. So I, I think you can see that I've, I've taken this, uh, the situation, uh, very seriously, but at the same time, you know, I, I take very seriously as, you know, um, I feel everyone's pain, um, as we're sitting in this kind of situation where we really don't know what's happening. So again, like, if you can share this, you know, with, you know, friends, family, other people that do jujitsu, uh, again, Minnesota, you know, other states, uh, you know, anybody wants this presentation, I'll, I'll gladly share. Um, you know, I just want, you know, people to understand that, you know, we want to, we want to be heard. We want to be able to, you know, tell people our situation, give people our thoughts on, you know, how do we do this responsibly? And I think if you, as you know, if you've sat in here and watched and listened to this whole thing, I think you would agree that I have tried to do this in a responsible as way, uh, manner as possible. That's why when I put this document together, you know, um, it wasn't just done in a vacuum by myself. I've had s several people, you know, involved in the process. I've had several people review the process. And, and again, you know, you know, people in the medical field, um, you know, I've had, you know, people in the political field that have reviewed this. Uh, I've had legal people, you know, look at this document. Um, so this was in good faith and my best effort uh, to put something together with the right people involved. Um, that would be the, the appropriate thing for us to move forward. Uh, so I'm going to sign off. Um, uh, again, if you made it through the, the whole presentation, you know, thank you. Uh, most people know that when I do go on on Facebook or social media, it's usually a, you know, a video, it's, you know, a minute or less and maybe three or four minutes at most. So this is, uh, you know, this is probably more, more video time than I've potentially spent, uh, on Facebook and the entirety of me being on Facebook. So again, thanks for listening guys. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out again, if anyone wants these slides, uh, please let me know and, uh, I'll make it happen. Thank you. See you guys soon on the map.